Mr. Chancellor, it is my honor to present to you Dr. David Keith to recognize his advances on finding practical solutions to climate change. Dr. Keith put the academic world on notice as a student in the 1980s when he finished first in Canada's National Physics Prize exam and then won MIT's prize for excellence in experimental physics. He would soon start on his path of examining how climate can be engineered, such as by injecting sulfur particles in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight back into space, or by directly capturing CO2 to convert it back to fuel. Dr. Keith has since studied the science, technology, and policy issues of such measures, as well as their potentially hazardous side effects on entire populations. Dr. Keith, now a professor of applied physics and of public policy at Harvard University, has also researched the climate impacts of large-scale wind power and pioneered studies of risk regulatory policy and public perception of carbon capture and storage. He emphasizes educating the general public, such as through his book, A Case for Climate Engineering, and through his popular online EDX course that provides a quantitative introduction to energy production and its environmental impact. Mr. Chancellor, on behalf of the Board of Governors and Senate, it is my privilege and honor to present to you Dr. David Keith, so that you may confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Congratulations, David, and I would like to ask Dr. David Keith to address the convocation. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President and Vice Chancellor, honored platform guests, graduating class, family and friends. Thank you. Thank you very much for this honor. I take this honor more as a recognition for the ideas on which my colleagues and I have worked than personally. I worked on climate change my whole career, and much of that, as you've heard, has been focused on carbon removal or solar geoengineering, the idea that humans might deliberately make our planet a little bit more reflective to reduce some of the risks of climate change. These two ideas have long been taboo. That this taboo is driven by concern that even discussion of these ideas will draw attention away from the necessity of cutting emissions. This is an entirely valid concern but it is not a valid reason to forego research on ideas that could supplement emissions cuts and protect humans and the natural world this century. In the last few years, these ideas have got much more attention. And so I take this honor not for me personally, but rather as partial recognition of the communities that have worked to advance these ideas over the decades. Ideas are always the work of many minds. My topic today is risk. But first, let me talk about safety. Lifespan is a powerful, simple, hard to fake measure of the health of human societies. A Canadian born today will live an average of over 82 years. A century ago, in 1922, that number was 57. Uh, and, and it's not just Canada, not just the rich world, the world average lifespan is now 73 years, the same as it was here in 1971. 
As Louis Armstrong put it, what a wonderful world, what an amazing human achievement is underneath there. I traveled to get here by car and airplane, but the risks that I took were small compared to what they were when I was born. Deaths per distance traveled in an airplane are now 10 times lower than when I was born in 1963. Deaths for traveling by car are five times lower than they were when I was born. This is an incredible achievement of a complexity of human action. It took only a month for after Chinese researchers first sequenced the, uh, the DNA sequence of the coronavirus before a German company founded by Turkish immigrants were able to make the first COVID mRNA vaccines for testing. Results like this do not just happen by accident. Science and technology are essential, but not science and technology alone, only when they are embedded in technology, public institutions, and trust. Millions of people collaborating, imperfectly but effectively, make the world a better place. Safety is great, but complacency can grow in its shadow. Flying here, I saw airplanes and orange juice that claim to be carbon neutral. Not so. This nonsense matters. It is an enabler of comfortable shared hypocrisy. We talk a good game about climate change, but our society is not remotely close to executing the pragmatic actions that would be required to cost effectively decarbonize our economies. We could do much, much more than we are. Such societies that tolerate nonsense, this nonsense or hypocrisy cannot succeed. Scientific and technological progress are built on trust. No one does an experiment or builds a bridge on his or her own. Each person knows just a bit and must trust that others did their part honestly. Groupthink is toxic and it gets slain by individuals who speak out, who take professional risks to look at the world as it is, not as we want it to be, and who communicate their truth with integrity. Think Greta Thunberg on climate. Think of Robert Malone and many researchers who took career risks to develop the mRNA tools starting in the 80s against decades of skepticism that assumed these molecules were too unstable to be successfully transported into cells. So it's with this in mind that I respectfully suggest that you take some risks. First, career risks. You got here by fitting into a system, by passing tests, by jumping through hoops. Congratulations. All that hoop jumping are tools of our meritocracy, as imperfect as it is. As you turn to your postgraduate options, think about taking on a little more risk. Many of you probably used a risk-averse strategy to get through school, through CEGE, through Concordia. You can keep that strategy going through a science or engineering career, and you can make a good salary doing so. But if you hope to make a bigger contribution, you will need to take some judicious risks. Try something new. Accept failure. Question the status quo. Question the way things have always been done. Doing so is always risky, whether in a company, as an academic, or in a government job. Think also of personal risks. The safe path is not necessarily the happy path. Traveling out of your comfort zone, either physically or socially, is hard. It's called a comfort zone for a reason. But the rewards, new people, new ideas, new understanding of how to live in this strange world, the rewards can be big. As a professor of Harvard and a founder of a, of a Canadian clean tech startup, you might assume that I aced my way through school. Not so much. I was dyslexic. My mom admits she thought I was cute, but a bit dumb. Wrong on both counts, I think. I got 51% in experimental physics at U of T, and I dropped out at the beginning of my third year and left Toronto headed for field work in the big wilderness. I now see my uneven path in school as a bonus. I was not accustomed to succeeding all the time. I learned what failure feels like. I was okay with walking away from academia to find some other career. So when making decisions, I was more willing to choose risky paths 
to work on weird topics like climate engineering or, or capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, or working on both technology and on public policy, because I was willing to walk away if the bets did not pan off. So consider how safe you are. Trust the physical and social safety net that our society has assembled and consider taking a few more risks with that net to catch you. Your reward might be a setback. Okay, then you start again. Or with luck, your reward might be the chance to nudge the world just a little bit in a useful direction. It is by individuals taking personal risks to explore something new that our societies end up with the technical and social innovations that allow our collective risks to be reduced. That's why lifetimes have expanded so much over the last century. Thank you for lending me your attention. Congratulations on your graduation. Thank you, Dr. Keith, for your wise words and a little bit about risk management and taking risks for the future. Thank you. <laughs>